So folks, the uh, the number of attendees seems to have uh, stabilized, so we might uh, start now. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to uh, our event tonight on road safety audits, uh, co-hosted by Engineers Ireland Cork Region and Engineers Ireland's uh, Roads and Transport Society. Um, I'd like to thank our, our presenter tonight, Peter Monaghan. Um, Peter is Managing Director of PMCE Limited, which provides expert independent engineering advice in relation to road planning and design, road safety engineering, including road safety audits, and traffic analysis and assessments. Peter is a Chartered Engineer and a Fellow of Engineers Ireland and works in the areas of road safety engineering and road highway design. Um, he's a specialist in review and auditing of proposed road and street designs and has worked extensively on projects in Ireland, Middle East and the UK. So without further ado, um, I will hand you over to Peter, but I might just mention first that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of, the, of your screens and you can use that to submit questions uh, for Peter and we'll take the Q&A at the end. Thank you very much. We'll hand it over to Peter. Thank you very much, Ronan, and uh, thank you very much to the uh, Cork Region Committee for inviting me to talk to you this evening on road safety audits and also to the Roads and Transportation Society for co-hosting this. Um, I hope everybody is staying safe and well as we cope with the various restrictions that we have to deal with these days. Um, I'd also like to apologise in advance. I have quite a number of slides. Some of them I won't be leaving up for very long. They probably include a lot of information that's available on the various standards and guidelines and other documents I'll refer to and uh, where appropriate there'll also be a URL. I know that the uh, presentation is being recorded so if anybody wants to go back and uh, look in more detail at some of those slides they have that opportunity. My agenda this evening is in uh, three broad uh, sections. The first is a, a background to road safety audits in terms of the legislation and standards that underpin it. Uh, the stakeholders, i.e. who has responsibility for road safety in Ireland, and also a, a brief discussion about Ireland's road safety strategy. I'll then talk about road safety audits in particular, what they are, who carries them out, and who has responsibility in order to get the process completed and closed out. And then towards the end, I'll just go through some frequently occurring problems that I've encountered in carrying out audits. Um, I've been carrying out audits or I've been involved in audits since 1997. Uh, to date, I've completed more than 2,000 audits. Um, and I would say that in terms of frequently occurring problems, they tend not to be individual problems, but more categories of problems. Every project we audit is, is individual and unique, um, but you can categorize the, the, the problems that occur by usually by design discipline or something similar. So firstly, that's look at the legislation that underpins road safety audits and maybe just before we even start on that i just wanted to um put up a slide to remind us about what it is we're here to talk about road safety engineering and road safety audits is designed or intending to avoid incidents like this occurring on our roads now later on i'm going to mention the safe systems approach to road safety and um, this applies in ireland it's it's embedded in our road safety strategy it also applies within europe and it's promoted by the un um, and we are by the way just coming to the end of the un decade of action on road safety but the safe systems approach accepts that humans make mistakes we're fallible and these mistakes in the context of our road network will result in collisions. Our goal as, as designers, as promoters of road schemes, as auditors, and uh, those of us involved in the maintenance of roads is to ensure as far as possible that the roads that we design and build and maintain are forgiving and that when a collision does happen, that uh, it doesn't result in a death or a serious injury and that the people involved can, can walk away. Put it another way, the penalty for a mistake shouldn't be death or serious injury. So in terms of legislation, um, if I just go through quite quickly, there is an EU directive 2008-96 uh, entitled Road Infrastructure Safety Management, and it requires each EU member state to establish and implement procedures relating to, among other things, road safety impact assessments, um, road safety ranking, management of the road network, um, and also road safety audits. Um, the directive is broken up into a number of articles and associated annexes, as you can see here. I won't be talking about anything other than Article 4, road safety audits. Each of the other topics in and of themselves probably warrants a standalone um, discussion or talk. Um, below the directive, we then have SI 472, which transposes the European directive into Irish law. 
It sets out the activities which are to be undertaken in relation to road safety on the Irish Road Network, and it also assigns responsibility to various organisations, for example, the Road Safety Authority, Transport Infrastructure Ireland, and on Garda Síochána. TAI have published three documents on their TAI publications website relating directly to road safety audits, uh, the standard itself, uh, 01024, guidelines, and also a separate document setting out the qualifications required for somebody to act as an auditor on schemes in Ireland. Before I leave the, the directive and the, the statutory instrument, I'll just point out that there is a new directive which has uh, been passed by the EU, 2019-1936, uh, which amends the original RISM directive. This is to be transposed into member state law by the 17th of December next year. And among other things, it extends the scope of the directive to cover all motorways and primary roads in member states and all roads outside of ur urban areas that are built using EU funds. The full text of the directive is available on the Europa website for anybody who has the, uh, the interest in, in, in looking into it. In terms of road safety in Ireland, there are a number of uh, organisations that have responsibility for road safety. And essentially, it's anybody or any organisation involved in the planning, commissioning, design, construction, maintenance or operation of a road has some role to play in road safety in this country. Also, road users have a responsibility. They must act in accordance with the rules um, that govern our road system. We have a national road safety strategy. It's coming to the end of its uh, life. It, it, it spanned the period 2013 to 2020. In terms of how we compare with our EU neighbours, Ireland ranks fifth based on provisional results uh, on 2017 data, which showed that uh, Ireland had about 33 road fatalities per million of population, the countries above us being Denmark, Netherlands, United Kingdom and Sweden. The strategy, which, as I said, spanned 2013 to 2020, set out targets um, for reducing the number of people who are killed or seriously injured on our roads. And the targets by 2020 were that we should achieve uh, deaths of no more than 25 per million of population, which is about 124. So far in 2020, there's been 127 deaths on our roads. So that target, unfortunately, hasn't been reached. And similarly, for serious injuries, the target was 330 or less by this year. In 2017, which is the last year for which I could get numbers, um, there was 927 serious injuries on our roads. Now, that's not to say that we haven't made progress. We've made significant progress over the past two decades. The number of deaths on our roads has fallen from almost 500 to around 150. And it's been around 150 for the past three, four, five years. So despite the significant progress, if you look at the right-hand side of that chart, what it tells me is that I think we're starting to plateau, that a lot of the, the quick wins and the low-hanging fruit have already been uh, taken and they contributed to the significant gains in reducing road deaths that we had in the early part of this two decade slide. And that any further gains that we manage to make in reducing deaths is likely to come as a result of increased effort and um, increased cost probably. Now, before we leave um, the statistics side of things, it's probably worthwhile having a look at who actually dies on our roads. Um, looking at the 2018 collision facts provisional ones produced by the Road Safety Authority, you can see here that the largest cohort is car users, that's drivers and passengers combined. However, if you look at the vulnerable road users or the non, uh, well, uh, vulnerable road users is probably the best description of pedestrians, uh, cyclists and motorcyclists, combined they exceed the number of car users that are killed. So there is a different way to look at the same data, which is what's the likelihood of dying if you're involved in a collision, if you're one of these road users. And as a car user, you've got a 1.3% chance of suffering a, a, you know, fatality, a fatal injury if you're involved in a collision. However, for pedestrians, it's nearly three times that. For motorcyclists, it's two and a half times that. However, it's less than that uh, for uh, cyclists. Nevertheless, this, this sort of gives a bit of a, 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 an insight into why road safety engineering and road safety audits will focus on non-motorised and vulnerable road users uh, above uh, car users and other vehicle users. I did mention earlier on the safe systems approach, and it's a particular approach to road safety which is prevalent, it's embedded in the Irish Road Safety Strategy, it's uh, embedded within the RISM Directive, and it's also promoted by the UN. And it, it, it makes 
a couple of fairly obvious assumptions, I think. Uh, the first one is that we are fallible, we will make mistakes, and those mistakes will lead to collisions. So the first thing is to accept that collisions are going to happen. The second thing is to recognize that there is a limit to the amount of energy, there's a finite capacity within the human body to absorb energy before suffering either a serious injury or a fatality. If you think of the road system, um, as a, sorry, the road network and the vehicles and the road users within it as a system, the safe systems approach says that the designers accept and share responsibility for the safety of the system. And that's designers, not just of the road network itself, but of the vehicles that travel on the road as well. However, road users also accept responsibility. They must comply with the rules and the constraints of the system. As designers, we can assist them by ensuring that roads are legible, easily understood and comprehended by a road user, and that they're forgiving. So that when a collision does happen, that it doesn't result in a serious injury or a fatality. So in summary, death and serious injuries in road collisions are preventable. It's a shared responsibility. Well-designed roads will reduce the probability of road collisions and forgiving roads will reduce the severity of road collisions. One final slide on the safe systems is just the idea of um, energy and speed. Buried within the safe systems approach is a series of probabilistic curves, which indicate when a killed or serious injury outcome is more likely, i.e. greater than 50% chance of it happening. Uh, so KSI is short for killed and serious injury. And that is when a head-on collision takes place at speeds greater than 70 kph, I won't go through all of these, um, or where vehicle pedestrian collisions take place at speeds in excess of 30 kph, but also where a vehicle collision occurs with a non-frangible, i.e. not passively safe, roadside object at a speed in excess of 40 kph. It's worth taking note of these speeds because they do indicate how frail the human body is and the limits on our ability to absorb energy before suffering some sort of serious injury. Just by way of legible roads, this is a photograph of my own that I uh, managed to take while I was out undertaking a safety uh, audit. Um, and this isn't a designed road, this is a legacy road, but in terms of legibility, what isn't clear on this picture is the fact that there is a side road on the left-hand side just beyond the stop sign. And a road user, particularly somebody who isn't familiar with this road, may not be aware of that and may not intuitively understand that that's the layout of the junction that they're coming to. So again, legibility so that road users fully understand the nature of the road that's in front of them and that they can act accordingly is something that we can bring to the table as designers and, and uh, uh, operators of road networks. So the road safety audit uh, process itself, we start with some definitions and I'm going to borrow this straight from SI472. A road safety audit is an independent, detailed, systematic, technical safety check relating to the design of a road project and it covers all of the stages from planning to early operation. A road safety auditor uh, will undertake a systematic evaluation of specific proposals and they will use a number of other tools as well. They will make reference to historical collision data and also to national collision data as control data. They may undertake a conflict study and um, this is where you observe a, a section of road or a junction um, and uh, take note of the number of near misses because a direct correlation has been shown to exist between the number of near misses on a section of road and the number of collisions that actually occur. Auditors will also undertake a risk assessment when they're producing their report and they will take account of the likelihood or probability of a particular type of collision happening and the likely outcome or severity of the injury that would, that, that would arise. So these are, this is one of my two quick slides. SI472 clearly sets out what a road safety audit is, who can carry it out, what the process should result in in terms of an audit report, what that report should contain, and also what the steps required in order to complete the process are. It uh, delegates a lot of the detail of this into the standard produced by TII. Um, and TII, in expanding upon this information, clearly says it, sets out that a road safety audit should only consider those matters that have an adverse bearing on road safety. It's not a check of compliance with design standards. You can have a non-compliant road layout which does not raise a safety issue. Similarly, a compliant design does not mean a safe design. So just complying with the design standards does not necessarily mean that there will not be safety issues that arise. A road safety audit has to consider the safety of all road users under all operating conditions, and it must make recommendations in order to address the potential hazards. I would point out here that uh, the audit recommendations will be relatively broad. The people best placed to make a decision as to how to address a safety issue that's identified are the design team.
they've spent more time with the project and understand its other constraints, whether they're financial or land or whatever they may be. And they may very well be able to address the safety issue by means of a different, rec different uh, way than set suggested by the audit team. So it's just to recognize that the auditors will make a recommendation, but the design team must either accept the recommendation as put forward or put forward their own recommendation to address the safety issue, assuming they agree that there is a safety issue. Audits are undertaken under a number of different stages, which roughly correlate with the design stages for most road projects. Stage F is undertaken in two parts, and a report will be generated for each part, and that coincides with route selection or feasibility stage of a project. Stage one is at preliminary design, and stage two at detailed design. For some projects, in particular small projects, uh, there's no requirement to carry out separate uh, preliminary design and detailed design audits, and there may also not be separate preliminary design and detailed design design stages. There might just be design. And in those instances, there's a single combined stage one and two road safety audit, which is deemed to be at the end of detailed design. And then stage three is undertaken post-construction and pre-opening to the traveling public. And stage four is during early operation, about two to four months following opening to the, the public. A road safety isn't an opportunity for the auditors to redesign the proposals. It is not a design by audit, and it's also not, as I said earlier on, a check for compliance with standards. It's not a scheme justification, and it doesn't provide a commentary on the appropriateness of the road proposals. It just seeks to identify any safety issues in the proposals. So it is neutral on whether or not the proposals should or should not proceed. And it's not confined to the scope of the project or the planning boundary in the case of a development uh, scheme. That's because the scheme implications in terms of road safety often extend beyond the scheme. It might just be a matter of meters, or in some cases it might be a matter of 100 meters, but the audit standard obliges road safety auditors to take account of the effect of any proposal on the wider road network within which it sits. Audit recommendations will also follow any issues that are identified outside the scheme. So it's just be aware that the auditors will not be looking at only what's within the red line boundary, they will be looking at the approaches and the tie-ins to see if the proposals generate any issues outside of the footprint of the project itself. Within the standards, there's a couple of tables that clearly set out what audit stages should be carried out for different scheme types. And it covers all of the scheme types that you would expect, including new roads, realigned roads, pavement improvements, um, safety barrier schemes, and also developments. And just for a moment, just to focus on developments, you can see on the table here that major developments uh, require audits uh, for all design stages from F all the way through to stage four. And the definition of what constitutes a major development is actually by cross-reference set out in the NRA Traffic and Transportation Assessment Guidelines, is specifically table 2.2. Now this table uses a number of different criteria to determine whether a development should be classified as a major development or not. Uh, one of the criteria is vehicle movements. So I won't go through all of the criteria here. You can refer to them yourselves. But for example, any development that generates a combined number of trips during all peak hours, so to, summed together, so it could be AM, PM, and midday peak if it exists, both in and out of greater than 100 is classed as a major development. Uh, another classification type that's used is development size by gross floor area. So any retail development greater than 1,000 square meters gross floor area is classed as a major development. Any housing development with more than 50 dwellings within an urban area with a population less than 30,000 is also classed as a major development. I think it's just important to understand that the standards obviously cross-refer to each other and you might need to read traffic and transportation assessment guidelines in order to fully understand whether or not the project that you're managing or involved with uh, falls into the category that requires uh, a road safety audit or exactly what type of road safety audit is required. The standard also clearly sets out what projects don't require audits, and these are generally like-for-like -like replacement, renewals, or, or repairs, uh, so long as they don't change the alignment, the cross-section, or the camber slash super elevation of the, the road in question. So replacing signs or safety barriers do not require a road safety audit. So who can carry out road safety audits? Well, as designers and as auditors, we all have a tendency to approach uh, a design on the basis of our own direct experiences. For example, if I'm able-bodied and I don't have any vision or mobility impairments, or maybe if I don't cycle that frequently or, or at all, 
I'll, I'll be unaware of issues uh, that could be created in a proposed road layout which would affect another road user. And the only real way for me to overcome these natural limitations on my, my ability to understand the needs of another road user is to be trained or by experience so that I can better understand what those needs are and identify where a particular proposal may fail to meet these needs. And in essence, that is a significant part of the training to become a road safety audit team member. Road safety audit teams include a minimum of two people, and where it is only two, one will usually take the role of team member and the other will take the role of team leader. In order to be an audit team member, you must be a road safety engineer or a traffic engineer, you must have completed a three to five day course in road safety audit theory and practice, and you must have been a trainee uh, on at least five road safety audits. It's very straightforward. To become an audit team leader, the qualifications are, or the requirements are a little bit more onerous. Um, so one set of criteria is that you should be a chartered engineer or equivalent. Uh, you must hold a certificate of competence in road safety audit, um, two years experience in collision investigation, three to five day course in road safety audit theory, have completed 10 road safety audits, either as a team leader or a team member. And within the preceding three years, you must have done a minimum of five audits and carried out two audits of a similar scheme type or and a sim similar stage, i.e. Uh, design st audit stage, for that uh, for which the approval is being sought. One thing I would say, and this is based on my own experience and, and, and my company's experience, is that the minimum criteria to qualify to be an audit team leader may not be the only um, factor that you consider when you're deciding who should take the role of team leader. Uh, some audit reports will end up in um, in another forum. It could be an arbitration hearing or it could be an oral hearing. So the qualities that you want from your audit team leader may also include the ability to take the stand and give evidence. Um, and it's just something to be aware of when deciding who is the appropriate person to, to lead a particular audit team. There are alternative audit team leader uh, qualifications for those who aren't chartered engineers um, and they have slightly different uh, requirements. You must be a road safety engineer again with two years experience of collision investigation, have completed the three to five day course, have completed 10 audits and hold a certificate of competence. However, within the preceding three years, you must have done a minimum of 10 road safety audits and a further day's CPD. And you must have done at least it been involved with at least four audits for a similar scheme type or stage for that with which approval is currently being sought. Just for reference, the Certificate of Competence uh, course, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the only one in the country at the moment is run by IT Sligo. Uh, the course URL is available there at the bottom. If you're interested in, in pursuing achieving a Certificate of Competence, it takes place over a semester, if I understand correctly. And that's a, a level nine qualification. So the process of road safety audits, how do we go about um, carrying them out? Again, the standard is the go-to place to find out. There's a very helpful flow chart. I've bulleted the main steps on the right-hand side and I'll go through those over the next few slides. But the very first step in carrying out an audit is understanding that an audit is required. So reference back to the tables that I mentioned at the, uh, earlier on in the presentation. But it is the employer who makes the decision or determination that an audit is required on a particular project, and then they request that road safety audit. If the audit or if the project is a, a national road scheme, they must register the scheme on the road safety audit approval system, that's the RSAAS, and get approval for the proposed audit team members. An audit brief is prepared, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, but the designer should have the correct level of detail prepared for the audit stage in question. That means if you're doing a detailed design audit stage two, you must have your audit brief at the level of detail that you would consider to be detailed design and you must supply it to the auditors, including all of the schedules that would normally go in as uh, part of the specification appendices, for example, safety barrier schedules, sign schedules and so on. Um, once the audit team have completed their work and submitted the draft report, the designer then must review the draft report and prepare the feedback form. Uh, we'll discuss the feedback form again in a minute, but essentially the designer must indicate whether they accept or reject uh, the problems that have been raised and or the recommendations that have been made. Where the designer does not accept some of the problems or the audit team do not accept an alternative measure put forward by the designers, an exception report is required. And the designer must prepare that, and the employer then must sign both the feedback form, 
if there is an exception report, they must issue the exception report decision form. And if it's a national road scheme, it mu they must submit the final report onto the road safety audit approval uh, system. Um, it's worth noting that for national road schemes, it, it uh, approval for uh, an audit team for subsequent audit stages is unlikely to be forthcoming unless the final report for the previous stages has been uploaded. The road safety audit approval system can be um, reached at the URL at the bottom of that screen there. It's also, the URL is included in the standards on TII Publications website. It's a fairly straightforward uh, platform to use. You register as a user, um, either as an auditor or as a client or both, and that allows you then to um, submit requests for approval. So earlier on, I mentioned the road safety audit brief, and this is really the main information that the design team and employer provide to the auditors. Um, I won't go through all of the information that's listed there, that's straight from the standard, but I think it's worth pointing out that an audit team can only review the information that they're provided with. Um, all too often in my experience, uh, designers, I think unconsciously, provide selective information to the auditors. They unconsciously choose what they think the auditors need to see and what is irrelevant. I'm not sure that designers are in all cases, best place to make that decision. If they supply insufficient information to the auditors, the auditors don't fully understand the proposed scheme and its objectives, it can result in a number of undesirable outcomes. Um, not least is the, is, the, is the fact that auditors, if they don't fully understand the scheme, will raise a number of safety problems, which if they did fully understand all of the objectives, they may not raise because they understand exactly what's being proposed and how it fits into the existing road network. This type of thing leads to inefficiency, and, and on behalf of the design team, it leads to frustration uh, because they have to respond to these safety problems when they feel that they shouldn't have been problems in the first place if only the auditors had known that uh, they had planned to carry out X, Y, or Z. But again, auditors can only review the information they're provided with. So I do recommend giving a, a reasonable amount of thought into what information you're providing to the auditors. Definitely include a description of the scheme and its objectives. If you have it, include traffic information. And if you're carrying out a road scheme, why don't you have traffic information? You pr quite probably have some form of traffic analysis. They should be included as well. And um, as I said earlier on, for detailed design, make sure you include information that's included on schedules, not on drawings, uh, so that the auditors can fully understand everything that's proposed. Once the auditors get the audit brief, the process that they'll go through is, is broadly as follows. There will be a minimum of two audit team members, one audit team member and one audit team leader. They will uh, familiarize themselves with the audit brief and the proposals. They will then undertake a site visit. And then a site visit is mandatory for the first audit that's carried out, uh, detailed design audit and stage three. But in my experience, if there's been a significant gap in time uh, between uh, the previous audit being carried out and the audit site visit being undertaken, we will undertake a, a a supplementary site visit to ensure that nothing significant has changed in the surrounding road network or new developments have been constructed um, and that we still fully understand exactly where the new scheme is going to sit within the existing uh, road network. Independently then, so separately, each audit team member will, will review the audit brief documentation. They'll seek to identify any aspect of the proposals that they feel will result in a road user failing to cope with the road environment. That's my definition, really, of what a road safety issue is. They'll then come together in the meeting, they'll go through their findings, and they will agree on what constitutes or what's uh, going to go into the final or the draft report as a road safety problem. And they'll also agree on what recommendation they're going to make in order to address that safety problem. They may include observations. These are issues that they've identified that they want to bring to the attention of the designers, uh, but which they don't feel are safety issues. And they could be errors in the documentation or they could be accessibility issues that don't give rise to safety problems. Once the draft report has been prepared and issued, issued the designer needs to review the draft report and decide for each and every problem whether they accept it. Is the safety problem a safety problem in their opinion? If they accept it, do they accept the recommendation? Designers shouldn't be afraid of putting forward their own alternative proposals. They know their scheme better than the auditors do, usually. So they can. there's an opportunity in the feedback form to put forward alternative proposals. If necessary, there's an optional meeting or a discussion between the audit team and the designers to ensure that both sides fully understand either the problems that are being raised or 
the scheme uh, proposals where there might be a misunderstanding uh, that the auditors don't fully understand what's being proposed. So a clarification and discussion meeting. Then the designers prepare the feedback form and where they do not accept the recommendations of the audit team, they get an opportunity to indicate, uh, the audit team get to indicate whether they accept the alternative proposals there's no requirement at this stage for revised drawings, in my opinion. It's simply sufficient for the designers to describe whether they are accepting the problems, the recommendations, or outlining what alternative measure they're proposing. At the end of that process, the audit report is done. A final report is issued and it's signed with a signed feedback form. Separate to that, between the designer and the employer, if necessary, an exception report can be raised and the exception decision can be issued by the client. So in terms of the process, some of the common issues that we've got that we encounter, one is a lack of timely audit team approval. So just bear it in mind, if your scheme requires an audit, don't leave it to the last minute, request approval, register it on the system if necessary, uh, well in advance. Often we get an incomplete audit brief and I've outlined some of the issues that arise with that. Um, Another common issue that I've encountered is the issue of auto brief information in installments. In, in order to fully appreciate uh, a road proposal and I suppose recognizing that me as an auditor, I haven't been involved with the project for as long as the design team have. If you give me the information in separate batches, possibly separated over time, this can result in issues being identified late in the process or possibly not being identified until construction is underway. So, Ideally, have all of the information issued in as few installments as possible. Um, I mean, the whole basis of an audit, uh, particularly the design stage audits, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's always easier to correct ink on paper. But once uh, construction starts, rectification becomes much more costly. So the earlier in the process that uh, issues can be identified and addressed, the more cost effective it is and the better contribution to the process we can make. Um, Design element coordination. Um, this is actually uh, an issue that comes up frequently on large projects where um, you have a number of different designers responsible for different elements and uh, poor coordination can arise between, for example, the signage designer, public lighting, landscaping and safety barrier designers so that when the auditor gets the information and looks at them uh, as a whole and realizes that there's a lot of conflicts or uh, for example, uh, items of roadside furniture are being positioned within the safety barrier you're working with, which just gives rise to uh, issues that are identified. But by far and away, the most common issue I encounter is the second from last. And that's where uh, a designer focuses on the recommendation and not on the problem. And this can give rise to uh, unnecessary uh, time and effort on behalf of the designer as they try and explain why the recommended measure by the auditor is either not feasible or practical or for some other reason isn't the right way to go and what they're really missing is that there's a safety issue there that's to be addressed. The designer is always the one best place to come up with the correct way to address it, taking account of all the other scheme constraints. It could be land take constraints or there could be cost constraints. It could be very various other constraints other than safety that apply to a project. So focus on the problem not on the recommendation. Um, if you're fortunate, the recommendation is something that you can accept and immediately implement without little uh, cost in terms of time uh, or any other penalty, but it's the problem that should be the focus of your attention when you're reviewing the draft road safety audit and uh, responding to it. So I'll, I'll just touch on some frequent uh, road safety problems that I've encountered. Um, and I'm gonna start with urban streets and roads because it really falls into one large category and that is facilities for non-motorized road users, whether they're cyclists, pedestrians, mobility impaired road users or visually impaired road users. I've listed there some of the issues that come up quite frequently for cyclists. Sometimes it's the lack of any measures for cyclists um, in a heavily trafficked, congested urban area. And particularly this year, it's become very obvious that the previous year's improvement in numbers of people choosing to cycle as they go about their daily life um, has accelerated uh, with COVID and lockdown and so on. Um, so the lack of any measures in an urban scheme for cyclists uh, is likely to draw the attention of an auditor as they're reviewing proposals. Inconsistent provisions. All too often it seems to us that designers uh, will put in place uh, measures for cyclists where it's easy to do so, where they've got plenty of space, and they will then uh, just ignore the, the tricky, uh, difficult to deal with uh, tight urban spaces, which are likely to be the areas where cyclists need the most help. So again, an inconsistent 
provision of cyclists, not just within a scheme, but within the scheme and the adjacent road network, is likely to draw our attention and is likely to give rise to some safety issues being uh, raised in an audit report. And then junctions. Uh, most cyclists uh, who encounter uh, or are involved in a collision, um, it's most likely to happen at a junction, and in particular at left turns, and in particular when it comes to heavy goods vehicles versus cyclists, the cyclists will always come off the worst. So we will pay close attention to the cyclist provisions and how cyclists are in, uh, expected to navigate through a junction and do so safely. Pedestrians, a failure to match up desire lines with the proposed paths that are uh, included within a scheme. Often it seems to us that the paths are simply an offset from the curb line because that's the easiest thing for a designer to do, but it doesn't necessarily look at what the actual desire lines for pedestrians are. A failure to include crossings at the appropriate locations or at all, and the placing of roadside furniture within uh, footpaths. Uh, I'll probably go through a few additional slides to cover on the mobility impaired provisions and visually impaired provisions, just talk about that in a little bit more detail, but just not my photograph, I've borrowed this from somebody else, but this is just illustrates the idea of uh, the designer putting the path in one location and the travelling public choosing a completely different route. And of course the safety issue here is slips, trips and falls, particularly during wetter or winter months. The placement of obstacles. This is often down to design coordination, where the public lighting designer or the signs designer weren't fully cognizant of all of the other uh, issues or somebody didn't take a, an overall review of, of what was being proposed. In terms of mobility impaired, the primary issues are about full height curbs. Whether there's a wheelchair user or an elderly person who struggles to uh, mount a full height curb, um, the primary issue is ensuring that we put in dropped curbs. Um, so the, the purpose of flush curbs or dropped curbs are to facilitate uh, mobility impaired road users. One of the primary issues that we encounter is that these dropped curbs or flush curbs are placed at a remove from where people want to cross. If they're 10, 15, 20 meters away from the desire line, they won't be used. They're a waste of time. They need to reflect the genuine route that these uh, road users want to take. In terms of sight impaired users, this is quite a, a large topic and I won't have time to go through every single issue here. Um, there's three main categories of sight impaired users. We have residual sight users who have some ability to see and for them the, the provision of a strong tonal contrast in the environment, for example coloured paving at crossings, that's tactile paving, wide footpaths and so on um, is quite important. Wide footpaths uh, allows them to avoid collisions with other uh, pedestrians, providing control boxes that vibrate or have tactile ro rotating cones on signalised crossings uh, so that they know when it's safe to cross, uh, level surfaces so that they don't misjudge uh, and trip uh, because they can't see it. For long cane users, um, the issues again are different, but again, the, the provision of guidance tactile paving is very important for long cane users. Um, and then for guide dog users, uh, sorry, tactile paving. So where we've put in flush curbs to cater for mobility impaired road users, that creates a hazard for visually impaired users, particularly long cane and guide dog users, where they could inadvertently walk out onto a carriageway, unbeknownst to themselves that they're walking into a road and put themselves at risk of being struck. So where we put in dropped curbs, we need to put in tactile paving in order to warn visually impaired people that they cannot proceed any further unassisted. Now, that means that an accessibility issue has been created, but it might not necessarily be a safety issue. One of my pet um, dislikes is discontinuous footpaths unnecessarily so. So for example, on the entrances and exits from petrol stations or the entrances and exits from underground car parks where footpaths are stopped and started on either side. To the road designer, it looks very well. To the car drivers uh, entering in and out of these premises, uh, it looks perfectly fine. But to a visually impaired person, that creates an accessibility issue that they cannot proceed independently along that section of road. I would much prefer for uh, private operations on private land, uh, not side roads, but petrol stations and so on, that they have to cross the footpath in the same way that private uh, homeowners have to cross the footpath if they have a driveway and they're pulling their vehicle in or out. That affords priority to the pedestrians and in some cases the cyclists, and it lets drivers know that they are crossing a path and the priority is to the non-motorized user. 
in the bottom right photograph there, it's just an example of a lack of tonal contrast. Despite the fact that there is tactile paving at that location, for residual site users, it will be very difficult for them to clearly identify exactly where the crossing is. Uh, finally, on the visually impaired uh, issue, um, the National Cycle Manual is the go-to reference in most cases for cycle facilities. However, I would point out that it's focused on measures for cyclists. It does not cover all non-motorized road user needs, and in particular, tactile paving. So in this instance, ladder tactile paving is shown where a cycle track is brought up to meet the footpath and create a shared surface. The issue with omitting that tactile paving is that a visually impaired person could inadvertently walk down the ramp and into the carriageway um, and not be aware that they are doing so because the, the, the ramp is very gradual. So the same issue arises here as it does with dropped curbs at junction crossings that you need tactile paving to warn the visually impaired person that there's a carriageway hazard there and a failure to provide it um, is a safety issue, not an accessibility issue in my opinion. I would point out that uh, many people have argued that the provision of this ladder tactile paving uh, is also uh, creates a hazard for cyclists. And I agree, in some instances, usually to do with maybe uh, how well or the quality of construction it can create a hazard for cyclists. But in this instance, I'm going to prioritise the more vulnerable road user, the visually impaired road user, over the able-bodied and uh, non-visually impaired cyclist who can uh, who has greater control over and the decision over where they they they, they cycle. Um, rural roads. So I'm very close to the end. So I apologise for the the length of the the, the talk. Um, back in 2013, uh, we were involved in a, a bit of uh, research review of all of the killed and serious injury collisions that occurred on national single carriageway roads over the period 2009 and to 2011, and we reviewed every single Garda report form for those collisions, about 500 or so. Of the 500, about 43% didn't have enough detail to allow us to create uh, or to reach an opinion um, on uh, whether or not the road was a factor in the collision. Now, not a cause, but just whether or not the road was a factor. So it mightn't have caused the collision, but if when somebody loses control, they then encounter a pole or a wall and suffer serious injuries, the wall or pole contributed to the outcome, the injury severity. What we found that was in 57% of the incidents that we reviewed, the road did contribute to the injury severity. 82% um, of these were rural and 18% were urban. I'm just going to focus a little bit on the rural. If you look at the fourth row from the bottom, you can see that 83% of those collisions, so these are killed in serious injury collisions, 83% involved collision with a, a non-frangible rural roadside feature. Uh, a separate bit of research that we uh, carried out where we reviewed, um, I was part of, I should say, we reviewed all of the road safety audits that were carried out on national roads for uh, a particular time period. We then categorised all the problems that were raised and all of the recommendations that were raised and categorised them by the, the general design categories that you would be familiar with in preparing proposals for a scheme. And the top six here, which are signs and road markings, junctions, other, which is essentially scheme specific, paved areas, i.e. footpaths, alignment and barriers represented 78% of the issues. So if you had no other takeaway from this talk this evening, they're the areas that give rise to the most safety problems identified in road safety audits. If you discount other, which is obviously very uh, unique to the individual schemes in question and include visibility, you still have 75% of all of the issues. Um, so the next few slides, uh, or in, in, in a short while, I'll talk about my own um, most frequent problems, but in terms of the research, they're the areas that give rise to the most problems being raised. We also looked as part of that research as to how the uh, issues that are raised, how they um, fared as the design progressed from preliminary design to detailed design to road safety audit. And you can see here that in preliminary design, poor junction layout was raised uh, as the most frequent issue. But by the time we got the detailed design, it was the second most frequent issue and then didn't appear at stage three, which is exactly what you hope to see, that as a design progresses and as audits are carried out at the end of each design stage, that the issues that are being raised are being addressed in the subsequent design stage and ultimately no longer exist uh, by the time the job is complete and open to the traveling public. Similarly, alignment and cross-section issues starts off as number two in preliminary design, drops down to number five in uh, detailed design, and then doesn't make an appearance in stage three, at least in the top six. I'm sure it makes an appearance in some places, uh, but it's quite far down the, the list. Other issues still stay in, inadequate facilities for pedestrians, and signs and road markings, 
And also at the top on stage three, hazards without sufficient warning, which is also signs and markings. Uh, hazards at the edge of the carriageway, which is either a safety barrier issue or a forgiving roadside issue, and they come to the fore. So onto my own list, and before I get into it, probably just a reminder that what I said earlier on, just because your design complies with the standard doesn't mean that it's safe in all respects. And that's the whole point of having an audit process, an independent review, so that we don't suffer from the wood for the tree syndrome that a designer inevitably has because they've been working up close and embedded in the design. So my, my list are design speed. All too often we see designers adopt what we consider to be an inappropriate or unrealistic design speed that is not likely to reflect the likely future speed of drivers on a section of road. Drivers will drive at the speed they feel is appropriate for the particular road. So if you're on a two lane dual carriageway posted at 60 kph, do not be surprised if the 85th speed or even the, the median speed is above the posted speed limit. A speed limit sign will not change driver's behavior if everything else that the driver sees is telling them otherwise. So ensure that you select the appropriate design speed. Inappropriate application of DMORs is an odd one, but it is something that we encounter all too often on rural roads. DMORS is a standard for urban environments and heavily built up environments. But all too often we see designers trying to apply DMORS in 80 kph or even 60 kph zones on the basis of the speed limit alone. As an auditor, I'm not interested in the speed limit as I said earlier on. I'm interested in the road environment and the whole environment surrounding the road. If you're in an urban area, a driver doesn't have to be told they're in an urban area. They know they're in an urban area. And if you're in a rural area, Equally, say, equally the same. So applying the standards of DMORS to a section of road that really isn't a street or an urban road is, is wrong and will result in safety issues being raised, usually around visibility and alignment and so on. A lack of facilities for vulnerable road users on rural roads. As designers, there seems to be a prevalent belief that there are no vulnerable road users, there's no pedestrians or cyclists on our rural roads, which of course isn't true. And the ability to provide a footpath along a rural road is a fairly simple exercise, particularly on a new alignment. And then we go into roundabout design, signing and alignment. I'll cover a few of these in a little bit more detail just in the next few slides. So as I mentioned, non-motorized users on rural roads, sometimes we don't allow for the uh, non-motorized users or the provisions are uh, discontinuous or uh, so on. These are the type of things that as auditors we look at is co consistency of provision and adequate provision for the types of road users we expect to see. Roundabouts are a particular problem. I mean, all junctions are the focal point for the majority of collisions that occur on our roads. But um, I notice with, with designers uh, that they can struggle sometimes, particularly where there's more than two lanes on a roundabout circulating carriageway as there is on this, uh, this diagram here. If you go to the design standard for uh, junctions and roundabouts, you'll be given three options uh, for how to deal with the crown within a roundabout in order to ensure that it's adequately drained and that you're providing positive camber to people navigating the roundabout. So with the exception of roundabouts in uh, below 60 kph area where you simply have crossfall from one end uh, from the inner to the outer, or vice versa, sorry. Um, the most common uh, layout I see is the one on the left-hand side, a single crown line at about one-third, two-thirds split between the outer uh, ICD and the central island. However, when you're doing the road markings then, quite often designers will put the road marking at the 50% mark, which will result in traffic on the outside lane straddling that crown line. And in particular for high-sided vehicles or vehicles with a high centre of gravity, this can result in instability and overturning either on the exit, but more sorry, on the entry or more commonly on the exit from the roundabout. Also on roundabouts uh, in particular is a driver's ability to know exactly where the roundabout is as they approach, in particular again in high-speed sections of rural road. The, the driver likely knows that there's a roundabout ahead, the warning sign and the direction sign tells them that, but the chevron signs are located so far to the left, the driver in the right-hand lane may not know exactly where it is so that they can begin to slow and brake on their approach, which can result in drivers coming into roundabouts too fast and failing to stop, leading to overshoot incidents. So on multi-lane approaches to roundabouts, quite often you need multiple sets of chevron signs, usually two, but one of the sets should be visible in an approaching driver's eye line about SSD distance from the giveaway line. 
Also, deflection on the entries at the end of it um, is often overlooked. Uh, the approach alignment of the outer curb should be tangential to the central island. Otherwise, drivers come in too square at too high a speed and overshoot. And in this case, uh, we can see the tire marks in the gravel where they've actually entered the central island uh, and thankfully missed the sign on this particular instance. Um, so like I say, the standard is fairly clear as to exactly what the geometry should be on the entry to a roundabout, which has been achieved here, but only with remedial works. The original alignment that you can see uh, was almost square, and then they had to amend it in order to provide a better uh, deflection in. And finally, landscaping. Um, I'm, I'm, I am a fan of uh, an aesthetically pleasing road, but we have to be careful that in putting in landscaping that we don't create a hazard. And there's guidance within the standard on what areas within the central island of around about are safe for accommodating uh, artwork or any other landscaping features. Signs and road markings, it all comes back to legibility. It comes back to the fundamental principles I talked about at the start. Signs are information that we put in place to assist drivers. If we overload them, they will just blank it out and they will use other cues, whether it's curb lines or road markings or tree lines. So signs should be used as sparingly as possible, but definitely should have the, the information required to allow them to navigate the road. Um, signs are also a hazard. You know, so the, we have to be careful about not only the type of signs that we put in, uh, but how much, how many signs we put in to ensure that we're not actually creating a hazard at the road, uh, where in this instance, if you leave the road, something, you're going to hit something. It, it, it mightn't be the first or the second or even the third roadside furniture item, but the, 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 the fourth, fifth and sixth one will definitely get you. And signs must be consistent. Uh, this road turns to the right. Um, at the, in the, in the distance, I, and it isn't very clear uh, because of the vertical alignment that, that that's what's happening. And that's why we have the uh, signs on the approach. However, the sign on the left telling you that the road turns to the right is directly contradicted by the Chevron signs on the right-hand side of the road. And particularly at night, when the only thing you can see are the signs and markings on a dark rural road, the driver may become completely confused as to exactly what's happening and make the wrong judgment and end up leaving the road. In terms of cross-section, the most common issue I come across, uh, for example, on high-speed dual carriageways is the standard median width may not be wide enough to accommodate um, signage within the median. And on multi-lane approaches to a junction, you do need off-side signs because if you've got a high-sided vehicle in the near-side lane, that could block visibility for a driver in the off-side lane towards the verge signs, uh, meaning that they're ill-informed and therefore ill-prepared to come to a stop as they approach uh, a junction or a roundabout or some other element of the road. And as I said earlier on, a compliant design does not necessarily result in a safe design. Uh, all of the parameters within this particular vertical alignment are compliant with the standards. However, as a driver uh, approaches the crest on the right-hand side, their eye will naturally be drawn to the subsequent crest, uh, making them less aware of what's happening in the sag in between, which just happens to include a junction. Now, this is a feature that we have on many of our legacy roads. These aren't designed roads where we have blind crests on the approach to junctions, but we definitely shouldn't be designing them into new roads. Uh, super elevation and the application or the, the choice of where to apply or remove super elevation is also key. On some designs, uh, due to topography, there may be a very, very slack longitudinal gradient or very, very large radius sag curves. And you must exercise care if you choose to apply or remove super elevation at these locations because you will create a flat spot. It will build up the film of water, particularly during the winter months, which can turn into black ice. And I'm getting close to the end. Uh, vehicle restraint systems. As I mentioned earlier on, um, most of the collisions that result in fatalities or serious injuries on our national rural roads involve collisions with non-frangible rural, uh, or sorry, roadside objects. And these are walls, boundary walls or parapet walls. Um, so just bear in mind that poles, gate piers, ditches, walls, these are the things that are killing people on our roads. Even when we do the right thing and we put in safety barriers, sometimes we neglect the fact that a safety barrier deforms when it's struck. So if a vehicle hits this barrier upstream of that sign, the barrier is likely to deflect about a meter or 1.4 of a meter, which will result in the vehicle being directed head on, head on into that uh, sign support. And similarly here for this lighting column, which is located in front of a safety barrier. So we need to exercise uh, care and coordinate the design elements um, between safety barriers and roadside furniture, whether it's signs or lighting, to ensure that we don't create problems 
rather than sell them. And um, also remember now this particular picture, this arrangement may be okay, but curbs, full height curbs in front of safety barriers can result in a vehicle that leaves the road being uh, popping up in the air before they hit the barrier and then hitting the barrier too high for the barrier's design. And that results in the barrier just folding flat and the vehicle progressing down the embankment or into whatever hazard it's uh, supposed to be protected from. So on most roads, high speed roads, I know the standard says, but I think most roads, you should have a full batter low height curb in order to ensure that if a vehicle does leave the road, that they strike the barrier at the right height and the barrier then will do its job and stop the vehicle from, uh, prevent the vehicle from encountering whatever hazard it's, it's being protected from. And then tie-ins, usually tie-ins with our legacy road network, and usually on side roads on major schemes, they often get uh, very little attention. Uh, and sometimes the, the tie-in is just affected abruptly because no thought has been given on how to transition drivers from the new wide section of road onto the old legacy section of road. And particularly on an unlit road at night, drivers may fail to see that the road has narrowed, find themselves putting two wheels into the verge, losing control and encountering a tree, a pole or a ditch. So before I leave you, just a couple of recommendations. These are specifically around urban design, to be honest. Um, I would recommend that everybody familiarize themselves with these because they are very helpful to me as an auditor and hopefully to you as a designer or uh, somebody responsible for ma maintaining or operating roads. The traffic management guidelines published by the Department of uh, well, whatever the Department of Transport, um, which is still in existence and includes lots of further references towards good documents and obviously DMORS, the design manual for urban roads and streets. But for a deeper read, practical road safety auditing, uh, which also goes through an awful lot of the common issues that arise. But then the documents published by the National, National Disability Authority, both the Trinity House research that they carried out about a decade ago, the Building for Everybody series, the UK Manual for Streets, and the National Cycle Manual, they all contain very relevant information on what various road users need and how to best cater for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I suppose one of the drawbacks of uh, the online environment is that, that, that we can't give you a round of applause, but I, I, I'm sure um, the audience and myself were, were very grateful for a very informative lecture. Um, I'm, I'm a roads engineer of you know some some number of years of experience, but I, I certainly uh, learned a lot tonight. Um, so look, folks, we we might launch into the the Q and A. Um, down at the bottom of your screens, you'll see a Q and A button. So if you might use that uh, to, to to ask any questions. Um, so I might just, um, there was one query there uh, from Justine Delaney um, as to whether we could see the flow chart again at the end. Um, I suspect that's to do with the, the process. We are recording tonight's lecture and we would hope that uh, later in the week that we would have it up on the Engineers Ireland YouTube channel. Um, so um, a, a number of people there have put in the chat, they've, they've, they've thanked you there, Peter, for a very informative lecture. Um, so. Going to the Q&A, um, we have a query there from Owen Curran. Um, a quick query in relation to exception reports. Uh, do you just complete the RSA feedback form as usual, include a table similar to 3.1 page 20, and then he's given the, the, the reference uh, GESTY 01027 for the RSA team to complete. Uh, once returned to LA, the exception report is uploaded, uploaded to the uh, RSA is and TII completed RSA exception report decision form. Um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll do my best to to answer that. There yeah. is a uh, there is a, a sample uh, layout for exception reports in either the standards or the guidelines. I can't remember which document, but there is a sample one there. But as far as the auditors are concerned, uh, once the designer has completed the feedback form and signed it, and of course the employer signed it as well, any issues that require exception reports, 
require exception reports. It's it's fairly clear, uh, and the audit team uh, leader will normally have put no in the rightmost column to indicate that that's what's required in the exception report. But that's the end of the audit process. The audit report is complete. It includes the feedback form as an appendix uh, to it, uh, and that gets uploaded separately. Then the designers and the employer must prepare the exception report in accordance with the template that's in the standard, and uh, also the exception uh, report decision form, and upload both all, all three actually. So there's three separate documents that will get uploaded to the road safety audit approval system. Okay, very good. Um, we've got no more questions there, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, uh, where an auditor raises an issue which is then addressed, do the changes to the design need to be re-audited? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, I mean, it, 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 it's a very, it's a very qu quick answer, but the answer is no. Uh, I suppose the system trusts that the designers are going to um, carry out the remedial measures or the changes to the design. Uh, and of course, if it's an early design uh, stage, there will be subsequent design or audit stages so that uh, each subsequent audit will review the previous audit reports as well. So any issues that were raised and not closed out will be checked again in the subsequent audit stages. But the short answer is, is no. Okay. Um, um, are hazards associated with motorcyclists often obvious to designers in your experience, such as unnecessary vehicle restraint systems, manhole cover placement in lanes, etc.? Uh, to say that they're obvious, um, not necessarily. It, it depends on the information that we're given. I do normally uh, insist on getting um, a certain set of documents and in particular um, uh, getting the drainage so that I know where the manholes and the gullies are placed and so on. Uh, manholes in particular uh, within roundabout circulating carriageways would be a particular focus of mine or within junctions. Uh, unnecessary safety barrier, um, I'm not 100% sure I've ever really come across that situation. Quite often it's, uh, in my experience, there might be insufficient safety barrier, but um, yeah, fencing I, maybe, guardrails I, I, I think he, might be unnecessary in some instances. Yeah, I, I wonder, um, just uh, I, I know on the Mallow Road there, there's kind of a you know two plus one and there is a, a wire restraint system between the two sets and it's often cited as being particularly hazardous to motorcyclists so perhaps something like that would be you know what, 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 what the um, not, not the question was about, yeah. yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, no, but definitely it would be looked at. But of course, uh, whether it's a wire rope barrier or it's a full uh, traditional uh, tension corrugated beam uh, safety barrier, if a motorcyclist encounters a safety barrier of any type, they're, go they're going to be in trouble. trouble, you know. Yes, yeah, okay, that's fair enough. A uh, question from Brendan Mitchell. Um, you mentioned that, in your opinion, following the designer's response to the audit feedback form, there is no requirement to update the drawings. Where a stage one or two RSA is required for a planning application, especially SHD, should the recommendation of the audit team be incorporated and the drawings update, updated prior to lodging the planning? We found that RSA comes too late in the process for amendments to be made prior to lodging due to client timelines. This can lead to local authorities stating that the recommendations of the RSA team have not been incorporated into the scheme. Any advice? Um, I can see exactly why such a, a need would arise. Uh, and yes, I, so when I say there's no need to make changes to the drawings, I suppose there's no need for them to be re-audited. But yes, I think the changes should be made to the drawings prior to planning. And I would suggest identifying by means of a cloud or some other note where the change has been made and why it's been made and cross-referencing to the problem in the audit report so that the planning authority, when they're reviewing it, can, can readily see what, what, what changes have been made and that they relate to the audit issues that were, were identified. Okay, very good. Um... I suppose I, I just in the lead up to the question you, you had spoken about, um, I suppose the the use of ladder tactile paving to identify cycle tracks and that. But I suppose the question here is, uh, what are your comments on shared spaces for cyclists and pedestrians? So once the transition has been made, and you know, you... yeah, they they are um, they're tricky to get right. That's, I mean, to be absolutely honest with you. So there's a, a few different types of shared surfaces. You can have a shared path, and that's actually quite straightforward because it's just a linear feature which is shared for a certain distance between cyclists and pedestrians. However, you can have shared streets. So you're talking about our major you know, uh, shopping streets in, 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 in urban areas. 
Um, they act as predominantly non-motorized road user areas, so it's a shared space where you have occasional uh, vehicle traffic uh, during deliveries or so on. Getting them right requires an awful lot of uh, attention to detail. Definitely requires the creation of a safe space at the sides of these areas so the visually impaired road users uh, can traverse them safely, which does require either a vertical change in level or the use of guidance tactile paving. It's shared spaces where I think quality audits, which are set out in DMORs, really come into their own. So a quality audit is not the same as a road safety audit. A quality audit includes a road safety audit as one component, but there's multiple other audits, including accessibility, walkability, cyclist audits, um, and also uh, audits in relation to, or reviews in relation to the whole uh, landscape and urban design fabric. So DMORs, I think, uh, DMORS type quality audits are really the best way to address the sort of large shared surfaces that uh, we like to see in our urban areas. And they are good, but they need to be done right in order for them to be accessible to all road users. Okay, very good. Um, if I could ask a, a question myself that, that I, I suppose kind of uh, is brought to mind by, by, by that topic, um, I suppose I've been on schemes where We've had cycle, you know, shared or, or cycle lanes next to, to, to pedestrian routes. And uh, on the approach to junction, signalised junctions, um, the cyclist has been brought back down to road level so that when they're going through the traffic lights, they're they're going through with, with the main flow of traffic. And they're they're kind of, it was the particular one I'm thinking, it was on a, what would essentially be a commuter route. And the attention was, you know, to, 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 to allow the cyclists to get through. But we did have some complaints or queries from people about that about you know bringing the cyclists having a, a change in, in 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 the vertical having a step or a ramp down um, and i was just wondering if you have any particular views on that um that method of bringing cyclists through junctions from I, a safety point of view yeah um so in terms of cyclists uh, a bit like uh, visually impaired road users there's actually two classes of cyclists that you're dealing with you're dealing with the confident commuter cyclist as you say yes. and then you're dealing with the leisure cyclist or less confident or even a child and if you've got the space you can cater for both so you can provide the direct route through the junction for the confident cyclist who doesn't mind uh, cycling adjacent to traffic and asserting their own position on the road there is a risk in that particular alignment, depending on how things are laid out and the volume of traffic, that if there's left turning traffic, that that cyclist becomes at risk. But it can be uh, mitigated uh, carefully in the design. In relation to the leisure cyclists, like I say, they would probably prefer to stay up on the level of the path, enter a shared surface, probably cross at a toucan crossing or something like that. It really is location and scheme specific and uh, looking at the mix. So uh, something that's in an, a, a, a suburban area versus a rural area would have a completely different solution. So I do think it is it is location and, and uh, road user type uh, specific in that regard. Okay, very good. Um, uh, somewhat of a lead on from that again, um, Peter Dwyer asked um, if, if you have any kind of examples of uh, shared surfaces or shared streets that, that are, are, you know, kind of top in class. Uh, none from the top of my, uh, off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, I have seen plenty of uh, shared street designs, uh, which uh, I think have done very well. And for example, just, just recently there in and around Grafton Street in Dublin, simply because I was doing some, so, some, some work uh, adjacent to it, um, I was looking at the details and I thought it worked well, but not home zones. My, my safety issues normally arise at the interface between a shared area and a segregated traditional road where you've got paths, carriageway, cycleway, and so on. And how do you let visually impaired uh, road users in particular know that they're now entering into a completely different type of environment and they need to move to the road edges? Um, so not off the top of my head, but I know I have seen quite a few, uh, quite a few so I'd, I'd have to give that some thought. Okay. Um... So, um, question, uh, after completion of a three to five day RSA training, uh, do we need to check with the organization for the RSA process um, in-house or is there a procedure uh, for the continuation to RSA applications? Um, 
I think you'll That's you'll have a CPD certificate. So depending on the organisation that runs the three to five day course, but generally speaking, um, the the course that I'm most familiar with because I've been on it myself uh, more than once, to be honest, uh, is the course run by TNS. Um, they will issue a CPD certificate. Um, you can then uh, provide that if it's a national road scheme. You can provide it, uh, submit it through the RSAAS, and they will uh, accept it as accreditation uh, or part of your accreditation. Um, or you, if if it's not a national scheme, you can you can use it uh, when you're submitting it to local authority or whoever is going to approve it. Okay, very good. Um, uh, question: um, Are road safety audits also completed on temporary traffic management plans uh, at Roadworks? I had a whole section on temporary traffic management that I had to ditch because, <laughs> as you could tell, the the, the 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 talk was very long. And in fact, yeah. temporary traffic management is probably uh, an audit, or sorry, a lecture in and of itself. Um, these days, under the RISM directive, there's no need generally for temporary or uh, road safety audits on the design of a temporary traffic management. Um, it's covered under um, a, a separate process, which is set out in the standards. However, for particularly complex layouts and uh, long duration layouts, uh, the employer may decide that that's the right thing to do. And yes, we do audits of temporary traffic management um, and uh, they come with a whole host of their own issues. Okay, okay, that's fair enough. Um... Brendan Larkin, uh, what information could we be collecting during, during the project phases to assist the RSA stages, um, particularly uh, stage three and four? Stage three is very simple. Uh, it's just the previous audits, uh, to be honest, uh, should be made available to the audit team, particularly if they're a new team coming in. It's, it's good practice, I understand, that the audit team would be consistent throughout. It's not always possible for various reasons. Um, but for stage three, when I'm going out to do an audit, I'm looking at what's been built. I don't really want to know what was intended to be built, what was shown on the drawings. I want to know what's actually been built. For stage four, the key thing that we constantly uh, struggle to get hold of is we're supposed to review a list of any incidents that have occurred since opening. Somebody should be keeping even a spreadsheet uh, record of where incidents took place and what type of incident it was so that the auditors can get, so that you can get the best value out of the audit uh, at stage four. Yep, very good. Um, uh, question how uh, have you come across bus stops in your audits presumably yes and uh, about accessibility issues or what issues I suppose in general would you I hate to say it again but I, I, I think I could talk for an hour on bus stops um, particularly in urban areas um, rural areas it's a little bit more straightforward I mean accessibility issues don't always result in a safety issue but they do result in a significant inconvenience um, but yes I have and there's a, a number of uh, uh, schemes coming through the system at the moment that I've been involved in audits, and I won't name them or mention them, but they are in, in, in heavily built up urban areas, and they are trying to deal with the issue of cyclist safety at junctions, but in doing that, uh, they've created some uh, difficulties. They're not insurmountable, and I think they've come up with the best design that, uh, possible for accessibility at bus stops, but it is that balance between accessibility and safety, because what you give to one road user, you might be taking away from another, and designers really do, and the employers have to make a, a decision as to yeah. the right balance there. Yeah, you're kind of robbing, robbing pa uh, Peter to pay Paul. Um, um, would it be advisable to have PI insurance if you're a team leader? Is, is there a possibility of litigation rising out of... Yeah. I'm not aware of any litigation in Ireland, um, although we have been involved in quasi-judicial type proceedings like arbitration and so on and oral hearings. Okay. Uh, I only have anecdotal information that there has been... Um, uh, an auditor involved in litigation in the UK. It was a criminal prosecution for negligence. Uh, the auditor wasn't the primary uh, person being prosecuted, but they were in included, as is the case with, with construction schemes. Anybody who even touched the, the contract documents probably got included. Um, in terms of PI insurance, I think it's, it's a must for any, any, I mean, audit isn't a design activity, but I do think you need professional indemnity insurance. Um, and the requirements, depending on the client that you're working for, will vary uh, all the way up to 6.5 million for uh, some national road projects. So it does depend on the, the project itself. But yes, you definitely need BI, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, well, it would seem that, that, that any consultant would have, have it as by, de by default anyway. Um, uh, Philip Fleming, uh, the last road safety strategy, 2013-2020, um, what are the main lessons learned when undertaking a roads project? What would you, what would, should 
the new strategy concentrate on? Uh, so I suppose, what would be your kind of top, if you were to 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 author the the, the new strategy, what was would be the thing that you would uh, like to see changed? Hmm. I'm I'm not sure I could answer that here. Um, I know there's a consultation process going on, but uh, I think the last strategy was was actually quite successful, despite the slide that I said showed that it didn't meet the targets. But I I, I personally am a firm believer of setting uh, stretch targets, stretch goals. So make it make it difficult to achieve. Whatever we achieve as we try to get there will still be a good achievement in and of itself. I think the RSA are doing a, a it will probably do a very good job of producing a strategy. But ultimately, it does come down to will and funding ultimately those two things that's fair enough um again on, on strategic housing developments often the scheme changes post audit due to the pre-consultation meeting can the original comments be applied to a slightly changed layout or is the audit, audit void and need to be redone time constraints also make this very hard to turn around in time for full uh, shg submission it's hard to answer that without knowing exactly what type of changes we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think you can consult with the audit team. Um, I'd, I, personally, I'd have no difficulty in taking a phone call, having a team's meeting, looking at a drawing on screen, and I'd be able to give you, and any of my colleagues would be able to give you a fairly quick uh, answer that, no, I think that needs a new audit, or no, that doesn't need a new audit. But, you know, I, I think it is a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Um query uh, question then I, I might kind of summarize it but i suppose is there any um is there any flexibility for an auditor auditor to advise uh, the design team on issues before the formal report is issued uh, or is it a case of once you're uh, brought on site to, to to do an audit you can only audit what's what's there or well i suppose in this case actually sorry it's in, it's in terms of the design yeah, I think I think as the design progresses, and particularly for a large uh, project or a complex project, um, it's not unreasonable and it's permitted by the standard for the designer to seek the opinion of the auditor as the design progresses. Whether or not it's reasonable uh, kind of depends on, I suppose, the approach that I've taken to pricing it. Uh, but if I know in advance that there's going to be some consultation required, I'll just allow for it. Because when I'm pricing a job, it's basically time and materials, and uh, I end up with a lump sum. So if you're fair to me, yeah, I'll, I'll be answering questions and, and giving guidance while doing my best to not step into the role of designer. I do not want to become the designer, or I'll lose my ability to be independent. OK, very good. Um, two comments rather, rather than questions um one is from my counterpart part in the rose and transport society carl Kavanagh, um and just saying on behalf of the rose and transport society thank you for for a great presentation uh, thank you, carl. and thank you. uh the second one is um from valerie fenton who's who's my um is the the, the vice chair in the cork region and she just said very informative and refreshing a reference team or in, in in CM disability docs and also quality audits and again she 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 thanks you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh, what's your opinion on short sections of crash barrier being installed, particularly where they are less than the tested length for which their certificate is was obtained? I'd have to give that particular issue uh, a significant amount of thought um, because in, in principle I can't be sure that that barrier is going to uh, operate as intended but it does depend on the specific location. I might deem the short length to be the lesser of two evils and think that it's worthwhile. However, my preference is to have no safety barriers at all. I think we should be, should be able to design roads uh, with forgiving roadsides that don't need barriers. Okay. Um... And I think uh, we've we've actually arrived at the the, the final uh, question um, from Peter's experience um, for problems items raised during the stage three audit, which are compliant to the standards. If the designer doesn't ex accept the problem on the basis that the design is in accordance with the standards, what's the likely outcome of an exceptions report? Um, I actually don't know fully because I'm never involved in the in the subsequent process of the exceptions report. Although I, I, I can think of very few instances where I wasn't able to clearly convince everybody on the audit, because the stage three audit generally has a number of observers. So uh, there'll be representatives there from the designer or the road authority or the contractor. And when we identify a safety issue, everybody normally 
agrees immediately because they can see exactly what the safety issue is uh, and they're more interested in coming up with the best way to deal with it um, after construction, which is the hard part. So uh, any that goes to exception report, I don't know what the outcome is, but I wouldn't be afraid of an exception report. If you feel strongly enough about it, put it in and let the process run its course. You'll get a decision one way or the other. Yeah. Um, I, I tell you, I, I, a few more questions have <laughs> popped up there. Um, so I might, I might just take one or two of them. Um, so um, I suspect this is a very specific case, but at a junction, control crossing uh, are provided for pedestrians on three arms of, a, of the four arms, example of national roads with uh, local roads adjoining. The link road arm has a courtesy crossing. Do you think this is acceptable in an urban setting? Uh, considering vulnerable road users, um, as it, it seems to be an inconsistent approach and in conflict with standards. And second, can a derogation or departure from standard be a reason for accepting such an approach? It really comes down to the exact uh, specific layout and whether or not I would consider it a safety issue, but it's definitely something that I'd be looking at and something that I'd be uh, querying, um, to be honest. And in fact, I was only on a site visit earlier on today in Galway where just such a situation uh, existed. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that when I have my meeting tomorrow with my audit team member, they're going to raise that as an issue. So um, is it derogation or relaxation? I suppose that's outside the realm of the auditors. I mean, uh, responsibility. Ultimately, the employer decides what gets accepted and what doesn't. Okay. Um, um, on the topic of friendly roadside environments, the, re the recommendation is to have roads and cuttings more than on embankments, but yet most primary preliminary designs don't accommodate this. Would this be a proposal that could be introduced into road safety strategies? I suppose it could be in theory, but in my experience, again, depending on the location of the road, the vertical alignment is, is more often than not uh, determined by a combination of drainage requirements uh, as well as topography. So there, there could be overriding practical considerations that uh, can't be overcome, uh, despite the fact that it might be a desirable uh, road safety uh, result. Okay. Good. Um, so I might just um, read out one more, um, I suppose, just maybe a, a slightly topical one. Um, where COVID mobility measures are put in place, are there any stages of the RSA that the designer can omit in comparison to the standard approach? Has, has it made any change to the RSA? Um, I, I would have thought that, for at least for the type of measures that I've seen going in, I would have thought that a combined stage one and two of the design, because usually there's only one design stage for these COVID mobility measures, there's no preliminary or detailed design, uh, so a stage one and two, and I think it would also be prudent to get a stage one and two because it might just uh, raise an issue that can be readily fixed before you actually go out and construct, um, but I can understand timelines can be very tight on these type of schemes. Okay, okay. Um, so look, I, I, I might draw the, the, the evening to a close. Um, again, on behalf of ourselves in the Cork region and our colleagues in the, the Roads and Transport uh, Society, I'd like to thank Peter for a very excellent and informative lecture. Um, I think the, the number of attendees, I think we were kind of up around the 170, 180 mark, um, and the number of questions, especially in the Q&A at the end, is an indication of the interest in the topic and, and, and the quality of the, the presentation. Um, so once again, Peter, thank you very much. Um, you. And I'd like to, to also thank our, our, uh, our audience for attending, and I'd like to thank my colleague, um, Ellie Gleeson, who uh, organised the lecture. Um, so, uh, just at the very end before